Hello, everyone. Welcome to another um, Apple Tree Bites in a Bite. And uh, welcome, Brian Solis. Hey, hello, hello. How are you? Uh, thank you for doing this. It's such an honor. We have uh, a philosophy sort of that summarizes our DNA, which is based on, on Newton and his apple. So uh, we always say that you know, he wasn't the first person to see a, an apple fall, fall from the tree, but he, he was the first person to look at it differently. And to apply what we call new thinking, uh, which is a way of, of changing um, the perspective of a problem and then finding solutions that make us grow as a society. And the final question is, in the year where we, we've been talking about social dilemma, the problem with misinformation, the algorithms, AI, the pandemic, um, all of these incredible complex questions, where do you think in businesses or in society in general, where do you think it is critical that we apply new thinking? I think education. We're teaching our children uh, how to live in a world that doesn't exist uh, and won't exist by the time they're ready to take on their jobs. And that, by that, I mean, uh, we teach linear thinking. Uh, we teach hierarchical, uh, we teach hierarchical learning and, and uh not just learning, but also how we operate within schooling and then eventually work. Uh, one, in fact, uh, as Sir Ken Robinson uh, has long touted, is that we have to actually bring creativity into the schools uh, in, a, in a way that is, is that it nurtures the soft skills and then also uh, into uh, our work so that we're creating a, a, a workforce that's not only empathetic and not only creative, like saying those things, but that you pr putting them within the roles that those things can thrive. A lot of um, a lot of key words there. I think a, a key sort of a takeaway for me is change and uh, being able to transform and adapt. Is there has there ever been a year where that's been more necessary than this one? The difference between today and the years before is that all of that is accelerated. All of that is dramatically uh, apparent today. McKinsey found that in, in the U.S. that we've seen 10 years of e-commerce growth in 90 days. Uh, so that acceleration is, is clear all around the world. But now you add to it the emotional complexity of a pandemic. But we are thinking about the meaning of life. We are thinking about what's important. And I can tell you that from this point on, we will be different as a society in what we value, how we measure success, where we're headed. Uh, things like soft skills become much more important, like empathy, creativity. Uh, we have also other, uh, other aspects of <clears throat> what this means for the jobs of the future, if we're going to accelerate on all, all things digital and then all things soft skills. Uh, so yes, it's, it's different because of COVID, but it's also accelerating the change that we've already been seeing that we needed to make. As marketeers, um, we all want to keep up with the latest and greatest technology at the same time, uh, acknowledging the, the, the need to find a happy life. I know in, in your latest book, I think Lifescale, you, you talk about how to balance that. How, how can we sort of uh, fight the good fight while keeping, keeping up the, uh, uh, to date with, with the latest marketing innovations. That's, that's, that's the life scale solution. It was about understanding the role. Every time you pick up this device, every time you scroll, every time you share something, every time you comment, you are literally rewiring your brain and your body. Uh, and the more that you do that, the more that you become a very different person than you were before your relationship with the smartphone. And it's just a fact. It's, a, it's called persuasive design as they, they introduced in Social Dilemma. There's a lot of design techniques. The whole point, if you, if you just think about the very logical basis of what, what a, a social network is or what an online game is, they are meant to change your behaviors so that they can consume more of your attention. Because the more time you spend in one of those apps, the more that they can monetize your attention. And that's how they make their money. So we are essentially the product. And the more 
they get us to do new things like share more pictures, share more videos, engage more with other people, uh, jump on the latest trend, do the latest dance there. It's called social engineering. They're changing society. One new feature, one new app, one new service at a time. But what they didn't study, they, they figured out how to change you. But what they didn't study was what are the effects of that change over time? But I will say that in a society that is moving towards AI automation, AR, VR, in a world where we're going to need, if you look at the job skills of 2025 by, published by the World Economic Forum, we're going to need to be a more creative, empathetic, critical thinking society. Just look at politics around the world. There is no critical thinking right now. Uh, people actually think they're th doing their research and they're thinking, but they're actually only fortifying their own beliefs. And so they narrow their world. They narrow their perspective. And so they, th without even realizing it, they've put themselves in a position that's going to be left behind as society starts to progress because it always progresses. The model that you very well described is based on advertisers. What do you think? How can we um, start to convince, you know, you work in one of the biggest tech companies in the world. Uh, I work for a lot of advertisers that spend a lot of money on these social media platforms. So how can we start to communicate a, a more responsible way of thinking about these social media platforms, about the way we target consumers? Social media has been intentionally used by bad actors that have that absolutely want to sow chaos uh, in the world uh, because it's in their favor. It's actually profitable for them. Like something that's designed like that, you know, is six times more viral than the truth. And that's should absolutely scare everybody. Yet people think that it's the truth. That's the scarier part. Social media has consistently shown and specifically YouTube and Facebook, that they want to monetize that activity. Uh, and they have shareholder pressure to do so. Uh, they, if you look at uh, Kevin Roos is, is, a, is a very well-known uh, technology figure in the United States well, and around the world. He has a, a Twitter account called Facebook's Top 10. And it's essentially the 10 most shared links on Facebook every single day. And eight, nine, sometimes 10 out of 10 of them are false or lies or misinformation or disinformation. They're absolutely provably false. Uh, and that, that, that right there should say, okay, advertisers, we're just going to, anything that shows up around these links every single day, we'll just build algorithms so that we don't show up with any of that content. But yet, they're the most popular links on the world's biggest social network in the world, billions of people. And they sell those impressions to advertisers who measure those impressions, but don't ask any questions about the caliber or quality of those impressions. So they, you know, as long as they've expressed some type of interest in something that's relatively interesting to that brand, you, you buy it sight unseen, right? Until you start showing what that brand looks like next to some of this stuff, next to some of this, these comments, this activity, you know, then brands might not even might not have even known otherwise until they say, oh, this is happening. If you look on YouTube every single day that there's there, there are lies and conspiracy theory videos that are that rampant throughout the network. And some of the world's top brands are showing up as pre-roll uh, or, or alongside these, these videos, YouTube does nothing to take them down uh, because they're incredibly lucrative uh, and, and they only take them down with pressure. So advertisers got together and said that they are going to withdraw their, their advertising until these networks pull away from hate. And they did nothing about it. They felt like it was going to have a minimal impact and they just moved forward and they were right. Uh, so, the thing is, is that unfortunately, this is probably going to have to be something related to regulation because what's happening is beyond advertising. We're actually socially engineering a world where the fringe of, tr of, of just the fringe of conspiracies have equal and sometimes greater authority than the truth. And that is not sustainable in this world. It's not 
it's not a world in which we can live in uh, in any sense of harmony or productivity, uh, any sense of progress, if, if conspiracies have the same weight as truth. Uh, and that's where we have to fight. You have this optimism. And you, you said it here today before, you know, how can, you know, I don't want to change back. I want to change forward. How, how do I use um, technology to become more productive, more creative, happier in a, in, in a way? So the question is, do you think that um, we can use AI automation and, and innovation to solve the problem that you stated before? So is there a way uh, that we can reverse engineer technology so that it's not about misinformation and manipulation. The hardest part is recognizing that you have to look in the mirror. Uh, I, I had to look in the mirror and recognize that I was part of my problem. It was easier to blame everybody and everything else. Uh, and once I got there, which was the hardest step, it was then moving in a new way forward. AI can only enhance uh, the algorithms of which I learn and unlearn what I, what, I, what I decide I'm going to move forward with. Uh, AI can help me be all the things that I want to be. Uh, just like in work, it can help us do all the things that we want to do. It could take away, for example, the, the, the less meaningful tasks uh, and put into a repetitive process automation of which then can free us up to do more creative things, more empathetic things, more engaging things. So yes, it's all possible. It's just that we have to want to do that. In order to want to do that, we have to look at the end game or not the end game, but at least a different series of outcomes that involve optimism because optimism is a key pillar of innovation. You have to have an idea. You have to believe you're going to do good or something better. Uh, and those things drive uh, or should motivate the decisions we make moving forward. But we're going to need, in order to fix the world at this level, uh, we're going to need the types of alliances that are incredibly powerful, that understand the relationship between technology and humanity, that we can accept that we're not on the best path today, uh, that this isn't sustainable, and that we can do a lot of good things. Mark Benioff, uh, who, who is the uh, CEO and also the founder of Salesforce, uh, co-founder of Salesforce, he, he talks about stakeholder capitalism. And you know, it's, it's understanding that capitalism isn't just about the bottom line or shareholder value, that it's also the impact of building trust uh, within communities. It's also the impact of serving a role within communities. Uh, and it's also uh, creating a much more sustainable world where that profit and those good things come from from actually having a more positive footprint moving forward. I want to thank you very much. Uh, it's inspirational as, you, as, as always. I hope we can do it again. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, keep, keep, keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> you, you too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm.